Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. I was not raised with the knowledge of Advent. In most Southern Baptist churches, this very special time of the year leading to the birth of our Lord was and is completely non-existent. However, over Thanksgiving, I attended the Southern Baptist church that I was raised in with my parents, and what do you know? They are now observing Advent. Can you believe it? Slowly but surely, Baptists are coming around. You give them another hundred years and they might observe Lent. Or maybe not. Now, just because a church has Advent on the calendar doesn't mean they know or they accurately teach what it means. For Advent is a season of repentance, but it is also a short season. There's a duration in that season of repentance dealing with joy. Joy because we meditate on how the Lord Jesus comes to us. And this is our delight. I mentioned this last week. It is a reversal of how one normally thinks. Most people think that it is their business to get to God. And this, as I said again last week, this is the basic doctrine of every other religion in the world. Getting to heaven by one's own efforts. Yet against this, Christianity and even Advent make it very clear, no, God comes to you. First, Christ Jesus came long ago. This was Christ's first advent, and you all know what, what it involved. It was the angel Gabriel speaking in the ear, so to speak, of this young girl named Mary. The eternal God becoming mortal, born as a child, a helpless infant in Bethlehem. Of course, this involved him going to the temple years later and teaching the rabbis and the priests and them being absolutely astonished at his teaching. It also included John the Baptist appearing out of nowhere saying, the Messiah is near, get ready to meet him, repent and be baptized, all of that. This advent included his triumphal entry to the shouts of Hosanna, and the waving of the palm branches and the taking off of the robes and laying it before the animal upon which he was riding. And of course it involved him suffering and dying to save the world, as well as his bodily rising from the dead. All of that is his first coming. It's his first advent. His second advent is his return on the last day. And the clouds, clouds, of glory. I say it like that because the, this is what Bible writers, they, they use the word clouds, but I think when you and I see it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow our minds. We're going to say, it's like a cloud, but what? But it's not. It's not. And so this is his second advent. He's no longer covered in humility, but he is shining with a brightness that will make the sun look like a dimly lit bulb. It's where he comes, as we just confessed, to judge the living and the dead, to raise the dead to life and transform those who are alive at that moment, transform them, as the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, in an instant, giving all who trust in him eternal life, as well as condemning those who have refused his gracious offer of forgiveness, life, and salvation. So during Advent, we observe what has taken place in the past. We keep an eye on what will take place in the future. More on that in just a moment. However, there is another theme in Advent. Now, this is what the Southern Baptists, bless their heart, you always know before you say, bless their heart, you're getting ready to throw them under the bus. 
This is what the Southern Baptists, bless, bless their heart, know nothing about. And if they did know something about it, guess what? They'd be Lutheran. And this is the theme of Christ coming to us today. In the present. Not just in the past. Not just in the future. But now. And this is the glorious thing about coming to church that you can't get when you watch church online. It's about hearing the gospel preached in your ears. It's about having your sins forgiven. And it is about receiving the very body and blood of Jesus Christ into your very mouth. Take, eat. Jesus comes among us today. Now. And he does so in his word and sacraments to feed us, to nourish the faith that he's already given us, and to shepherd us. No, it's not as glorious as this second advent will be, nor is it as gritty and earthy as his first advent was. A colleague of mine used to always refer to Jesus as being the Jesus who came to us with dirty fingernails. We kind of like our Jesus kind of, you know, cleaned up a little bit. You know, kind of clean those up, cut those a little bit. He would say, no, he comes to us with dirty fingernails. So again, this theme of the Lord coming to us now, it's not as gritty as it used to be. It's not as glorious as it will be. Nevertheless, he comes to us in the present. And so this threefold theme of Advent, past, present, future, it's seen in Revelation 1.8 where Jesus, the ascended, resurrected Lord, he declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I think we've got one of those here on our Christmas tree, Alpha and Omega, somewhere around there. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This morning, though, second week in Advent, we specifically look to the future, the Advent of Christ's return. But wait a minute, didn't we just do that, that as the church year came to a close? Well, we did. Next year, we'll do it for three weeks in a row. The three last Sundays of the church year. Third Sunday to the last Sunday. Second Sunday to the last Sunday. And then finally, the last Sunday. And all three, as you might imagine, deal with the return of Christ. But when we did it, we only did it for one week, but that was Christ's advent from St. Matthew, where being ready calls for faith, trusting in his word, trust in the promise that all of our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. However, today on Populus Sion, we hear what the end will be like from the prophet Malachi, as well as from the, pro or rather from St. Luke. Malachi simply calls it the day, capital D. Luke records the Lord himself calling it the kingdom of heaven drawing near. That beloved, you be ready. That you prepare now for that day. That you order your lives to meet that day and that you not be confused or shaken when it comes. The Lord gives his disciples the signs of the end. Signs in the sun and the moon and the stars on the earth. Distress of nations with perplexity. The seas and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them from fear. And the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We know that from the time that Christ ascended into heaven until the day that he returns, there will be and have been troubles in the world. Troubles that Jesus calls signs. Meaning they're supposed to teach us something. They're supposed to indicate or point to something greater. It's like a sign on the highway that reads, next, air, next rest area 17 miles ahead or last free exit before toll. I'm always looking for that sign. Get me off this road. I don't want to pay the government more money. Jesus calls the troubles of this world signs because they tell us something. They tell us all these troubles. They tell us that he's going to return. 
Now, in our lifetimes, we've seen all kinds of signs. We've seen solar eclipses. We've seen blood moons, super moons, shooting stars, and stars burning out. All signs where? In the heavens. And my goodness, if you just go back and look at Christ's crucifixion, there were all kinds of signs in the heavens that took place. What of the distress of nations? Oh, just turn on the news. We have that all around us. Wars, famines, plagues, oppressive and corrupt governments which have marked every generation since our Lord uttered these words. Just take, for example, the pandemic. I mean, we're still dealing with the pandemic, the fallout from the pandemic. Along with terrorism, both international and domestic. What about perplexity? Seems that men are more confused now than ever. Man, medication for perplexity and anxiety? Somebody's making a lot of money. Seems to be prescribed left and right. God has been driven out of our schools, our society, our entertainment. Fallen men, blinded by secular doctrine, reject the creation and the God-given order of creation, so much so that there are people who do not even know if they are a man or a woman. Perplexity abounds. Confusion multiplies. This fallen world is backwards and it is upside down. And just as one of our shut-ins said to me recently, Pastor, I just don't understand this world anymore. Me either, sister. Me either. Why did she say that? Because she knows what is sinful and wrong is now touted by fallen men as normal and right. See also Romans chapter 1. What about the seas and the waves roaring? Well, we've seen that too. Tsunamis and tidal waves and floods, they wipe out large portions of cities and fear and failing hearts are on the increase as the de-evolution of our society continually pushes men further and further and further away from God. And with all of this, with all of the signs having already been fulfilled, men still refuse to repent. You would have thought that a, a, a worldwide pandemic would cause men to repent. Did you see that? I didn't see that. I was in church the day after 9-11. Church was full. What did they tell us during the pandemic? Church is not essential. So guess who showed up? Nobody. Interesting. Very interesting. They're all signs, folks. All of them designed to get men to repent and to return unto their Lord. And to them, what the prophet Malachi says is, this day will be like a burning oven, and all who do wickedly will be stubble. The day which is coming shall burn the unrepentant and the wicked up. Again, have you noticed how, how, there, how, the, how there's very little fear of judgment these days? I mean, what frightens us is being away from our iPhone. <laughs> We're running out of juice. Or losing our retirement. Or looking silly before others. For the most part, we neither fear, or we fear neither death nor what follows. But this shouldn't come as a surprise. The scriptures are full of examples of men refusing to repent in light of impending judgment. I mean, remember the days of Noah? How the Bible says, the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. No one believed Noah. He was, as 2 Peter says, the preacher of righteousness. The Lord gave him the details for the ark that he was going to build, but guess what he did? He went out and started preaching. He didn't get to building right away. He was a preacher of righteousness. No one believed him, even as he and his family, along with the animals, entered the ark. 
And then when the Lord brought the flood waters down, those outside the ark, of course, they didn't have a chance. Consider the citizens of Sodom. Their desire for pleasure so overpowered them, so controlled them that when sulfur and fire rained down from heaven, they went up like smoke with only Lot, Lot and his daughters making it out safely. Do you know you can go to Sodom and Gomorrah today and you can dig out sulfur balls out of the walls? You can lay them on the ground and you can light them on fire and they'll burn. And they smell bad because it's sulfur. Then there's the firstborn of the Egyptians and the crossing of the Red Sea. There's Rahab in Jericho, Jeremiah along the, Babylonian, uh, along the Babylonians, and on and on and on. It's always the same. The Lord sends forth His word, but who believes it? Church, if you have grown apathetic to the Lord's return in glory, repent. If you live like he's not going to return at any moment, repent. If your daily grind has lulled you to sleep so that you're not ready for his return, repent. It's like Jesus, so to speak, is splashing us in the face with the water of our baptism this morning. And he says, remember repentance, remember sin, receive forgiveness, and trust in what he has promised. For those who believe his promise of deliverance, they are rescued. Just as the word said, they're, they're whisked off like Lot to a nearby village or protected from the waters in the ark with Noah or they pass through the sea on dry ground with Moses or they're saved by the scarlet cord that hangs from the window on the walls of Jericho. However, the Lord chooses to save his people during his second advent, sparing them from the judgment he brings against the ungodly. For there is always, praise be to God, there is always a remnant. And that remnant will always have a way of escape. But believe, beloved, Jesus doesn't give us these signs to weigh us down or to lead us to dissipation or to lead us to drunkenness as you heard. Hear it again. He says, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads. For your redemption draweth, King James, it draweth nigh. When Jesus comes again, he comes as your redemption. Think of that. It's not your destruction is drawing near. It's not your punishment is drawing near. It's not even your damnation is drawing near. No, your redemption is drawing near. Yes, it's the last day, but it's not going to be the last day for you. For the one who comes in the cloud is the one who came in the manger. The one who comes again in glory is the one who gave up everything for you, the one who bled, the one who died on the cross for you. That, who, that is who is coming, and there is nothing for you to be afraid of. It is the day of your deliverance. It's the day of your redemption. Yes, the world is coming to an end, but you're not. Listen to how St. Peter describes this same day. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see, on the other side of the last day, Get this, is the new day. It is a new creation. It is a new heaven. It is a new earth. And it's all for the baptized. It's for you. And there is no sin. And there is no death. And there is no dying. There is no devil. There is no sinful world. And there is no sinful flesh you'll finally be able to look upon the face of God without being destroyed. How does everybody speak to an angel in the Bible? In fear. So, much so that every angel says what? Fear not. The last day comes. The new day begins. You look at angels and you won't be cowering. And they won't be saying fear not anymore. They'll be saying, what's up?
And thus your posture is to have your open arms ready to receive your gift. For your king comes to you. And when he does, you escape all of this trouble and you will stand. And you are rescued out of this pilgrimage of misery and pain. Jesus comes as the one whom you've always waited for. And he's bringing you the things that you've always wanted. Peace and holiness, hope and joy and love. And to show you that Jesus is not one to be feared, the church has Advent. Where every year at about this same time, we start all over. We begin again. Telling the story from beginning to end. And at the beginning, we see that the sky is not falling. Rather, it's very crisp and clear. There's no hint at all of any chaos or any terror at all. The sounds you hear are the sounds of a favored, fresh, and blood, flesh and blood, rather, flesh and blood Saint Mary giving birth to the holy flesh of Jesus our King, the second person of the Trinity. The only tears are those of joy. And if anybody's feigning, it's only from being overwhelmed by the notion that the God of heaven and earth has put himself both into our cause and, to in, uh, and into our care. But this little baby Jesus. He will one day tell us that everything, everything will come undone. It will come undone to be redone into new heavens and a new earth and a new, get this, a new true humanity who are completely now in the image of Jesus Christ. Even though we can't speak it at times, this is the home that we want. And you'll get it because of what Christ has done. For God's chosen people, you, you who have been redeemed in Him, you get a fresh start in the Eden that is to come. Blessed Advent, everyone. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.